how, how does God see world history? I'm sorry, but how does he see world? How does God measure world history? I'm sorry? Instantaneously, right now. Okay, but, th but there's a way in which if we're having a biblical worldview, we understand how God measures world history. <coughs> Who said that? Christy, what did you say? That's exactly right. Israel, God measures world history, and you can determine world history by the way in which God is working with the nation of Israel, past, present, future. Because he told us that Israel, it's all began with Israel, it's all going to end with Israel, right? God took a man, Abraham, right, out of Ur of the Chaldees. He took his Ur hall, and he had to go, right? <laughs> don't make me... Don't make me spit on you. What do you mean you got to sit in the back? He took his Ur hall, and you know what happened, right? And then through Abraham, Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, the family that had to go into Egypt to survive. Why? Because of the, the drought and the famine. Boy, have you paid attention to the droughts that are taking place in the West and in California, Lake Mead, and that in a couple of years, if it continues the way it is, they're not going to be able to supply water to Mexico, to Nevada. I mean, you know, this is pretty concerning, isn't it? Wow but you don't build cities in the desert. <laughs> but anyway, because of the drought, they fled to Egypt, and God provided for them there, preserved them there. And then after 400 years of servitude, because unfortunately it became servants unto Pharaoh in Egypt, then God delivered his people out of the bondage of Pharaoh, a type of Satan, out of the bondage of Egypt, a type of this world. And he took a ragbag tan of uh, the slaves and he made them in the army of God, right? Brought them into the promised land. And it was glorious ever after, right? Mm, no, not really, was it? No. And then they no longer wanted a theocracy. They were being governed by God through their appointed leader, Moses, and then Joshua, Yeshua. But then the judges came along, and that didn't work out too well for them. And then what did they want? King. We want a king, like every other nation. We want a king. We want a man to rule over us rather than God. How crazy is that? But God gave them what they willed, and he told Samuel, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They rejected me, and God told them exactly what the king would do and how we would bring their children into subjection. And so, nonetheless, Samuel anointed the first king, Saul. Not a very good king, was he? No, no. That's a sweet sound, isn't it? No, that's okay. It's okay. You should hear some of my ringtones. <laughs> One of them is somebody's going to hurt someone. You know that tune? <laughs> no. Anyway, Saul, and then Saul wasn't a very good king, and then, and then God had anointed David through the prophet Samuel to be the king of Israel. And David was to be a type of Christ who would come, the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah, the promised one, right from the beginning in Genesis, the seed of the woman who would destroy the serpent, right? Well, and then came along Solomon, not like his dad, was he? No. no. And then after Solomon's death, he had the divided kingdom. And the nation went farther and farther into idolatry. And because of their idolatry, God had to judge, and God judged the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 B.C., carried them away in captivity by the Assyrians. Judah did not learn their lesson, and God was very patient over 100 years hoping that they would turn and not repeat the sins of their brother. Israel. But nonetheless, Judah had to be judged, and in 586 B.C., Babylonian came in and destroyed the city. After that was the third military siege against the city, finally destroying it, destroying the temple, carrying them away into captivity, and never going into the land again for 70 years, as God had promised, the 70-year captivity. But they never were the people of God after that. They came back into the land after the 70 years. Well, they were a religious lot, but they were still idolatrous in a lot of ways. 
And God had to let these Gentile powers rule over them and control them. And he prophesied that through Daniel, the prophet. He said that they would be controlled and ruled over by the Babylonians, by the Medes and the Persians, by the Greeks, by the Romans, and eventually by the revived Roman Empire. But we know that, that during the Roman occupation of Israel, that's when the Christ was born, the Messiah was birthed. But then the national rejection of the Messiah by the nation of Israel. All of this prophesied by God, all of this foretold, yet God, such a loving God, did not forsake his people, Israel. He had to punish them, discipline them, right? But he promised the restoration of the people. And after they were dispersed throughout the nations of the world, when Rome finally destroyed the nation, completely destroyed the temple in 70 AD, the emperor, uh, the Roman general Titus, the Jews dispersed throughout the nations of the world. And, and, and there were a handful, just a handful of theologians from that point on that ever thought it was even possible for the Jews to come back into the land, for Israel to become a nation of, among the nations once again. But they were forsaking the word of God. The word of God is certain, isn't it? The word of God is more certain than this planet that we're resting upon, isn't it? We learned last week that, that uh, in Isaiah 24, what's going to happen? We, le we learned in Ezekiel 38 that there's going to be a major earthquake when the Gog-Magog invasion occurs. And we, chapter 38, when we read that last week, when the, one of the results of the Gog-Magog invasion will be God's going to show himself to the entire world. He's going to shake the world. He said that, that there's going to be such an earthquake in Israel that every single creature on the face of the planet will feel its impact. The birds of the air, the beasts of the field, the fish in the sea, every man, woman, and child, every nation. And if you go back to Isaiah 24, Isaiah predicts this upheaval of the Earth's crust, the Earth's surface. It's a polar axis shift where everything is affected. And God is showing his power and his control through that. <clears throat> to wake up the nations. But he, he promised that he would preserve Israel. Why? For whose sake? His sake. For his own namesake. For his glory. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Go there for a minute. We'll begin there tonight. God knows the beginning from the end, doesn't he? He knows every one of our days before there was even one of them. He knows every single day of human history before there was even one. And so much of it he's foretold. And when we see so many of the prophecies, so many of the predictions of God being fulfilled, it gives us great assurance of knowing that everything else that he said that is yet to come will in fact happen. Those theologians that doubted that Israel would ever become a nation again should have been trusting in God's word rather than their opinions or man's speculation. But we put more regard in men's speculation than we do God, don't we? Unfortunately, not you, beloved. But in chapter 30, what God is predicting after he talks about the blessings and the cursings and how Israel would rebel against him, he talks about the fact that he himself will restore the people. Chapter 30, verse 1, Now it came to pass, when all of these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have said before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. Now, the northern kingdom went into Assyria, and they were, they were no more. The southern kingdom went into Babylon. When did Israel be dispersed? among the nations of the world after Rome had destroyed Israel in 70 AD that's, that's when they were dispersed throughout all of the nations of the world and, and God had determined that one nation one nation on the face of the earth would be the safest place for his people Israel for the Jew until the diaspora until they return what nation was that? America America make no mistake about that who discovered America? Columbus and what was Columbus? He was a Jew. By ethnicity, he was a Jew. By nationality, he was an Italian. But most people don't understand. He was a Jew. Isn't it amazing that God would use a Jew to find a safe place for the Jews? And that was his purpose. Because of the Inquisition that was taking place, the Spanish Inquisition in particular, where that lasted for one, one millennium. A thousand years. Can you imagine? But yet, God had preserved his people. 
And this is what he's saying here. When you're dispersed among the nations, when you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God drives you and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children and your heart and within your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity, have compassion on you, and gather you again from all of the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. This is the promise. Now, it starts with a little remnant, doesn't it? You know, I, I don't know about you, but I have been blessed in so many ways over the handful of Messianic Jews that I have studied and read under. Have you? Yeah. And what insight they bring us. Wow. Now, the, 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 the beginning stage, the first fruits, as it were. But we know that God has prophesied that there's coming a day where God is going to pour out his spirit among the Jews and all Israel shall be saved. Doesn't mean every Jew, but it means national Israel. We're going to come back to their God. They're not there yet. What do we read in Ezekiel chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39? What do we read? What does that describe for us? The restoration of the people after the diaspora, after they had been dispersed throughout the nations that were thrown out of the land because of their idolatry, because of their sin, because of the rebellion. What we have is, is the land restored, the people restored back to the land, and then the people eventually restored back to God. That's what chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39 are describing for us, you see. Precisely what he's promising here. Go to Zephaniah. Now, now, there's a number of prophecies I've kind of gone to this evening that indicate that God has promised a restoration of his people Israel. Zephaniah, and you can cheat. You can go to the front of your Bible and find out where it is. I think we should study through Zephaniah. It's a fascinating little book. Page 1270. Yeah, page 1058 in my Bible. <laughs> If you were to sum up the book of Zephaniah, it's the restoration of the Jewish people, of the nation of Israel. It's a wonderful prophecy. Jews should take this to heart. We're studying eschatology, end times. End times all has to do with Israel and God reestablishing his relationship with Israel. He didn't leave them. They left him. But he's going to draw them back. It is the goodness of God that leads to repentance, right? And they're going to see his goodness. But here, Zephaniah, let's uh, just look at chapter... There's so much here. It's so wonderful. But we'll go to chapter 3. After I do Ezekiel, I think we'll do Zephaniah. Verse 14, do you have a heading in your Bible? Yes, yes, yes. That's what this deals with. It deals with God calling his people back into himself. He himself initiating the relationship. Who, really, who initiated the relationship you have with Jesus Christ? Did you do that? Did you seek God? No, God sought you out. You didn't seek God. God saved me. I remember when I first got saved, I probably shared this with many before, they had these buttons. And the button said, I found it. You remember that? The, the campaign. You know how they have, the church always goes on to these campaigns. Found what? God was lost? God wasn't lost. God wasn't found. No, no, no. He found you. Right? God saved you. But this is God purposing to save Israel. Verse 14, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. Wow, praise the Lord. He's taken away our sin. And Satan has no hold on us anymore. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Satan has no power. You remember Paul? They're warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem. They're warning, you know, he's speaking to the Ephesian elders at Miletus. I think you covered that in one of your teachings not too long ago, didn't you? Talk about that, Miletus? Paul at Miletus? And so he said, no, no, why are you bending my heart? Why are you trying to convince me not to go? Satan has nothing on me, he said. Nothing with which to tell. Can you imagine such a thing? That you're so walking in fellowship with God that you know that Satan has nothing with which to tempt you. He's powerless in your life. That's what God wants. Listen, that's where God wants to bring every one of us. That's where he's going to bring Israel. That's what he's talking about here. 
Yes, taking away your judgments. Cast out your enemy, the King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day, this is the end time, the last days. In that day, the day of Israel's salvation, it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion, let not your hands be weak, for the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you in his love. Oh, I, I remember those times I needed to be quiet. Where my mind would go places I didn't want it to go, where, where I was in such confusion and pain and sorrow. And then he would wrap himself around me in the power of his presence and quiet me in his love. Right? You know what that's like. You know. We have difficult times sometimes, don't we? Uh -huh. No, we're just living in this life, right? Stand up for a minute. <laughs> no, I, I want to show you something. Stand up. When I'm distressed, when, I, you know, I, I, when I've blown it once again or done something stupid, you know, or, or maybe some distress comes into your life, what do we do? We just do this. Mm. Mm. Oh. That's what God's talking about. I want to I want to quiet you in my love. You ever have God give you a big hug and just quiet you? Quiet your mind, settle your heart. That's his promise to us. But but listen to me, listen to me. You let you have to let all the other noise go. You have to ignore all the other noise. And you have to get alone. And you have to let him quiet you. In his love. What a beautiful thing. He brought you into existence how? He formed Adam of the dust of the ground. And what did he do? He brought life through a kiss. You know, well, the best is, I think he kissed him. You know. He will rejoice over you with singing. <laughs> like a mom comforting her child, you know? There's that feminine aspect of God, you know? El Shaddai has another interpretation. We talked about the names of God um, Sunday. But do you know that there's another uh, uh, true interpretation of the name for God, El Shaddai? And, and it's, it can be rendered, do you know what? God of the breast. That's the feminine side of God, where how, how was a child nurtured and nourished by their mother? But through the breast, right? And, and how often does a mother comfort her child by holding that child close to her, to her breast, singing over her? Can you imagine God wanting to sing over us? That's not just for Israel, it's for us. Hmm. I get overwhelmed thinking about it. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. God is always there. Jehovah Shammah, the one who is there, always in our suffering and in our sorrows. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you, Israel. I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them a praise and a fame in every land where they are put to shame. At that time I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for I will give fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth. Then I will return when I return the captives from before your eyes, says the Lord. What's growing in our day more and more? Anti-Semitism. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that, that one, one party within the United States now has become very anti-Semitic and the people that are appointing to office, some very significant offices, are anti-Semites. And there seems to be no concern about that. Hmm. But we're talking about world history and how God governs world history. And he governs world history by the way in which he relates to his nation, Israel, to the people of Israel. And, and he predicted all of this. He said that the nation would be dispersed, that the nation would go into captivity in Babylon, but the nation, the captivity would only last 70 years. But he also prophesied when they are allowed to go back to Jerusalem and restore and rebuild the city and the temple, 
that there'll be a time frame in which God is working even in their rebellion and their religiosity when they didn't really know him in a relationship that they should have had. He said, the Messiah will come. And he even gave that appointed time. And we, we, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ was predicted by God to the very day. When we've been through that prophecy, haven't we? Yeah. And Messiah has come. And, and God has fulfilled his promise to the Gentile that, that the sons of Jacob, that the descendants of Abraham would be a blessing to the entire world. And so the Christ has been a blessing to the entire Gentile world, to those who would believe and live in him. Amen? So go back now to Ezekiel chapter 39. All world history is determined by God and the way in which he's dealing with the nation of Israel. What we're approaching here as we look at chapters 38 and 39, the Gog, Magog invasion of Israel. We started it last week. Was everybody here last week? No? Okay. Uh, maybe you have some understanding of chapter 38. I know you do, Christy. If you have an understanding of chapter 38, it's God predicting that a nation in particular and the leader of that nation will form a confederacy of nations that are going to come against Israel in the latter days. With, who's that nation? Russia. Russia. Russia is that nation. And Russia is going to use uh, the confederation, principally Iran, Persia, and Targoma, Turkey. Gomer and Targoma, one of the same, Turkey. And we see that, uh, I showed you a video clip last week, uh, that, that this year, those three nations and the leaders of those three nations gathering together to have a cons a con form a confederacy. And there'll be all of these other Arab states, Ethiopia, Libya, Put, Kush, uh, that are going to gather together and come against Israel in the last days, and it'll look like it's, it's an annihilation of Israel. That is, there's going to be no hope. But God intervenes in the midst of this conflict. Now, what's going to take place is this is going to be the end of the become the fullness of the Gentiles, where the church age is going to be completed. And then God is going to be dealing with the nation of Israel. We call that the 70th seven of Daniel, right? Why? Because there are 69 seven periods, 69 heptads or seven year periods in which God was dealing directly with the nation of Israel. And then it stopped. If you go to Daniel chapter, let's go there. Daniel chapter nine for a minute. This is a prediction of the 70 weeks. Verse 24 says, 70 weeks or 70 heptads, 77 year periods are determined for your people and for the holy city, his people are the Jews, the holy city is Jerusalem. He's speaking very specifically to Daniel about the Jews and Jerusalem. Make no mistake about that. We looked at uh, some other speakers who were twisting the scripture not correctly interpreting the scripture, but that's what this is referring to. To do what? To finish the transgressions, to make an end of sin and make reconciliation for the iniquity. When did that happen? That'll happen with the first coming of Christ. Look with me again. I'm in chapter 9 of Daniel, verse 24. Is everybody there? Yes. Okay. 70 weeks are determined for Jews and for the city of Jerusalem. And what are they going to be accomplishing? In those, in what is God going to accomplish during those 70 weeks? One, finish the transgressions. Two, make an end of sins. Three, make reconcili reconciliation for iniquity. When did that take place? At the cross. That, have, that took place at the first coming of Jesus. Then he said to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up all vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. When did that happen? It hasn't happened. That's going to happen at the second coming. This is the first and second coming predicted within the seven-year period. And what we understand from the prophecies of Daniel that God has revealed to us is that 69 of those seven-year periods have happened. They're done. They're over. That was accomplished. There's one seven-year period left where God is dealing directly with the nation of Israel. At the end of that seven years, all of world history will be done as we know it now. And then Christ will bring in his millennial kingdom. And after that, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Wow. Hmm. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The streets shall be built again, and the wall even as troublous times. After the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come, the Romans, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war of desolations is determined. Now we went through all of this before in our study in Daniel. 
And so you know what we're talking about here. Now, between verse 26 and verse 27, there's a gap in time. How long is that gap? It's been 2,000 years so far. That's the church age. At the end of verse 26 is when the Messiah was cut off. Jesus was crucified. And what happened to Jesus? He descended where? Into Hades. You believe that? Yes. yes, the Bible tells us that. Did he go to hell? Was he tortured? No, 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 no. no. Some preachers, I don't know where they get their nonsense from. But he went to Sheol, to the place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. And he was there for three days and three nights. And then he was raised from the dead. And then on the 40th day after his resurrection, he ascended up heaven and he cleared out that place of Sheol called Abraham's bosom or paradise. And now we await his return. And his return will signal the beginning of the 70th seven of Daniel. And that's what he's talking about here. When you get into verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Who's the he? Antichrist. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end of the sacrifice and offerings, and a wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolation, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. Wow. So, so that, that's what, now what we're going to be seeing in chapter 39 of Ezekiel is the beginning of the 70th seven of Daniel. The Gog Magog invasion is not Armageddon, and it doesn't take place during the tribulation period. You understand that? Two major conflicts at the end of the age, the Gog Magog invasion, which is the very thing that will precipitate or bring about the rise of the Antichrist. And then the Antichrist will seem to be a man of peace. Hey, I do get a p political from time to time. <laughs> when, when President Obama won the election the first time, I, I didn't vote for him, but when I listened to him, I thought, wow, maybe, maybe this will be different. He sounded great, didn't he? Yeah. Hope and change. And I mean, listen, there's, there's no question about it. He was a fantastic orator. Mm -hmm. He could give a speech. He was so persuasive. And I thought, wow, wow, wow. But then, as I tell you all the time, I listen with my eyes. And everything, everything he said he was going to do, he didn't do. He did just the opposite. And then you remember what happened. You know, we, we in the second election, and I stood up and I told everybody, now listen to me, beloved, I love you, but if you vote for Obama and you know everything you know about that man now, you're in sin. We had people leave the church. And they still haven't come back. If I run into him, I tell him, you know, come on back. I was right, you were wrong, but come on back. I love you anyway. <laughs> you know. The Antichrist is going to be Obama on steroids a thousand times over. He will deceive even the elect of God if it were possible. You've got to be very, very careful. We're, we're in the age of deception and deceit. How far do I want to go with this one? Do I need that? You do know we're going to make alien contact soon. <laughs> No, listen to me. Listen, the, 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 Satan is prepping the world. Oh, yeah. Th this is going to be the greatest deception on the world that has ever occurred. They're going to come and tell you that they're the ancient astronauts. They helped. They gave you all the secrets for you to advance your civilization. They brought about life on this planet, completely discounting the Bible. Yeah, they're sucking other brains right now. <laughs> But you understand, I hope, hope you understand that. There's going to be overwhelming evidence from a human standpoint that, that these aliens are real, that it's all true. It's demonic, beloved. It is demonic. And it's going to be the greatest demonic deception that's played upon the entire globe. And everybody who trusts in science and the speculation of man more than they do the word of God are going to be duped and believe that the word of God isn't true and that the God of the universe doesn't exist. But it was aliens, aliens that brought life to our planet. Aliens that gave us the secrets of our civilization. You understand that's where we're headed? You know, and, and the government's just re making these revelations a little bit at a time, aren't they? Aren't they? Yeah. The, the, wait, till, wait till the world community comes out and they're all going to say, you know, the aliens, yep, they're there. 
Well, I've, you know, I, one thing I love about the airports is studying people. Don't you like watching people at the airport? I got delayed in, in, in uh, Charlotte for about three hours, and I swear I saw reptilians. <laughs> no, 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 as soon as they, that's a reptilian. Look at that person. Definitely, definitely a reptilian. You know. Yeah, exa exactly. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but during that delay, um, I had the opportunity to witness to a uh, police officer who quit his job in New York and is taking a law enforcement job in Florida. And we had a glorious time. And he ended up praying and crying, and it was sweet. The Lord used me there. Praise God. But I did see reptilians. I did. <laughs> Back to Ezekiel, <laughs> chapter 39. I don't know why I do this, you know. <laughs> and, and, but, you know, we're laughing about it, but please, it's no laughing matter. Most of the world is going to be so duped by this. Yes, Arlene? Do you think that's how that explain why the rapture? Yes, of course they will. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They have to remove the undesirables, the people who won't work with them. <laughs> you know. You got, yeah, you got to get re re reprogrammed. Like an indoctrination camp, you know. If if you're a believer and you know the Word of God, it's so clear. But but most unfortunately, most people, even those who call themselves Christian, they don't have an understanding of the Word of God, and they think what we believe is absolutely insane when we know what they believe is in fact insane. It's given over to a reprobate mind. Where were we? Chapter 39 of Ezekiel. Now, God is prophesying against Gog and Magog. This invasion that's going to come in the latter times is two major conflicts that occur just before the end of time. It'll be this, this Gog-Magog invasion of Israel with a confederation of nations, but God is going to intervene. He's going to rescue Israel. Even when the whole world stands against Israel, the whole world would like to see Israel annihilated, and it's all satanic. We have so much to be thankful for, for the Jewish people and for the advances that they have made in our, in our way of life. Medical, uh, technical, technology, I mean, every field of study, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But there's this satanic hatred of the Jewish people. It's sad. But God's going to intervene and show himself strong on behalf of his people. The whole world will know it. Like 9-11 their return to God will not be real. You remember what happened right after 9-11? Churches were full. You had, you had, you had these, these reprobates on the, on the steps of the Congress singing God Bless America. Two weeks later, where were they? And, and now what's happened? And then what do we do? We, we vote in a, a Muslim president. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Right? I mean, think about it. But after God shows himself strong, there'll be a period where the nations of the world will back off of Israel and their hatred of Israel. And the man of sin will come to the forefront, making a peace with Israel in a covenant for one week, while allowing them to rebuild their temple. If you talk to an Orthodox Jew today and you ask them, they believe the Messiah is coming. They don't believe he's come yet, right? So they don't believe in the first coming of the Messiah. We know the Messiah has come already. But they, they're waiting for the first coming of the Messiah. And how will they recognize their Messiah? That's what they'll say. They'll say he'll be a man as Moses was a man. And he's going to allow us to rebuild our temple. That's precisely what the Antichrist does. When he enters into this covenant with them for seven years, he allows them to rebuild their temple. He allows the three monotheistic face of the world to use the temple mount without dispute, without argument, without war. <coughs> Who's going to use it on Friday? Muslims. The Muslims. Who's going to use it on Saturday? <coughs> Who's going to use it on Sunday? <coughs> Who's going to use it on Sunday? <coughs> the apostate church. Not Christians. The apostate church. <laughs> But in the, in the middle of that week, in three and a half years, what does he do? He goes into the Holy of Holies of the rebuilt temple, and he proclaims himself to be the God above all gods and demands that the world bow down and worship him. Now, that's when, that's the, the middle of the tribulation period where all God's wrath is poured out upon the world. 
Then, at the, towards the end of that conflict is when you have the war of Armageddon. You and I won't be here for that, praise God. We won't even be seeing the beginning of that, praise God. But what we are seeing is the beginning stages of the Gog Magog invasion of Israel. You, you, you've been reading the reports that they think that Putin has cancer, blood cancer. And, and that he's, he's losing control of his faculties. He's not making sound decisions. Well, he never did have control. <laughs> he never was making, he's a reprobate mind, you know. But it's, it's just, I mean, it's just fascinating what God is allowing to take place. What's happening in our world that makes absolutely no sense from any other perspective than a spiritual perspective, right? And then, oh, wow, wow, wow. Oh, my gosh, he's coming. We better tell everybody he's coming. The building's burning. You got to warn him, right? And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around. I will lead you on, bringing you up from the far north. Now, if you go to the extreme north from Jerusalem, you hit Moscow. Okay, so it's obvious he's talking about Russia. Some people say, oh, no, 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 it's not talking about Russia. It's talking about Russia and the leader of Russia. I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and I'll cause the arrows to fall from your right hand and you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all of the troops and the peoples who are with you. And I will give you the birds of the prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to devour. Hmm. David, you go hunting, don't you? You go hog hunting? What do you do with them hogs after you shoot them? You eat them. What do you do with the deer after you shoot the deer? You eat them. Well, you know, just the opposite's going to happen. Today, today, man kills beasts and eats the beasts. Well, in that day, man is going to be killed and the beasts are going to eat them. Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. And you shall fall in the open field of Israel. I have spoken, says the Lord. I will send fire upon Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Go to Isaiah 59 for a minute. Those living in security on the coastlands. Goes to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59, speaking of the coastlands, verse 18, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So who's he talking about? Now listen, he's talking about fire and brimstone from God raining down upon Gog and Magog and and. Uh, Iran and Turkey and Ethiopia and Libya and all these nations that are coming. But then this word here in the Hebrew, it means this word security in those living in the coastlands. It means from the farthest parts of the world, those living in an island, in the farthest parts of the world, as far as you can imagine from Israel. Fire and brimstone is going to rain down upon these people. Who might that be? The word there. I do believe where that's, that's where the United States may be mentioned in, in end times prophecy. If there's a mention of the United States, it would be here. Now, are we deserving of God's judgment? Are we not as sick as sick can be? Even the, Nash, the, 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 the World Athletic Association, whatever that group happens to be, at least they have some common sense. What did they say this week? Trans, Trans men should not compete in women's athletics. The world has more sense than we do. Europe has more sense than we do. We've lost our collective minds here in this nation and the things we're exposing our children to. It's absolutely demonic, isn't it? And are we not, are we not deserving of God's judgment? Mm. Now, if, if there were 205 million Christians in the United States, which is what they claim, do you think we'd have any of these problems? No, certainly not. No. No. The church is a remnant. The faithful have always been a remnant in, in the Old Testament, and the faithful have always been a res remnant in the church age in the New Testament, and the faithful have always been just a remnant even now. 
You need to understand that. Yes, verse 6 of Ezekiel 39, I will send fire on Magog and upon those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them profane my holy name anymore than the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Aren't you glad we're kept by his name? We talked about that Sunday. Remember, we went to the whole list of the names of God in the Old Testament and their meaning and how, how absolutely wonderful it is to know that that's who our Father is in our lives. Wow, but not to the world. Now, but well, the world is going to know we have a Father. And my Father's stronger than your Father. And my Father can take your Father. <laughs> right? Because we have their Father, the devil. The word of our Father God. And surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields, the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the javelins, the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. Seven years. What period of that would that be? That seven years? The tribulation period. And what are they doing for the tribulation period? Listen, now, Ezekiel can only describe things according to his vernacular, okay? He's never seen rocket launchers. He's never seen missiles. He's never seen attack helicopters. So he, he's just trying to make sense of what he's seeing in his vision. But God is using modern weaponry that's taking place. In particular, as we read this text and we see the, the cleanup of the battlefield, obviously there were limited nuclear weapons that were used. But Israel is going to be able to use some of the weapons that are left behind to, to supply their energy needs for seven years. Isn't that amazing? M most of, of Russia's nuclear weapons have a low-grade plutonium in them, not as high-grade as what we have in our weapons. So our weapons, our nuclear force, has a shelf life of something like three decades, you know, before we have to re-, re Prime the firecracker, right? You know what theirs is? Russian? Seven years. Seven years. Isn't that coincidental? Seven years. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I think that God is talking about here. That's why I think that he's revealed to Ezekiel. Look at verse 10. And they will not take wood from the field nor cut down any of the forest because they will make fires with the weapons and they will plunder those who plundered them. They will pillage those who pillage them, says the Lord God. I will come... To, it will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel in the valley of those who pass by the east of the sea. So this, this valley and this, this carnage where all of these dead bodies are going to be is east of the Jordan River. So where would that be? Jordan, present day country of Jordan. Jordan, it's in that valley there, east of the Jordan River. And it will obstruct travelers because they will bury Gog and his multitude there. Therefore, they will call it the Valley of Haman Gog, or the multitude of Gog. In seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all of the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown in it on that day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. It's going to be such a devastating defeat. Now, in the King James Version, it tells us at the beginning of chapter 39, how much does God leave a the invading force? A sixth part. Of all of these armies that have gathered together to come and destroy Israel, by the time God gets done with them, only one-sixth of them will be left. Five-sixths of the invading force is killed. It's going to be millions of people who are going to be killed at that time. That's what he's talking about. Seven months the house of Israel will be bearing them, and God will have gained renown. His name will be honored and glorified. Feared is what it will be. Verse 14, they will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and to bury those bodies remaining upon the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. Now, they can't even go into the battlefield and make a search for seven months. Why? It's radioactive. It's hot. So you understand these things. We understand these things today. You know, it's like the Chernobyl disaster. I mean, it's still not safe to go there, is it? No, no. So after seven months, they will make a search. Verse 15, the search party will pass through the land. Whoever, whenever anyone sees a man's bone, he will set up a marker by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog, the multitude of Gog. 
Now, there's going to be a temporary tent city that is going to have to be erected there. The name of the city will also be Hamanah, God. Thus, it shall be, thus they shall cleanse the land. And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and beast of the field. Assemble yourselves, come, gather together from all sides of my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat the flesh and drink the blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of princes of the earth, of rams and lambs and goats and bulls, of all of the fatlings of Bashan. You shall eat fat until you are full and drink blood until you are drunk at my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. You shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men, with all of the men of war. Thus says the Lord God. Wow. God is doing this. He's destroying this force as a sacrifice himself. Verse 21, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment which I have executed and my hand which I have laid on them. Why should we fear the Lord? Because I think we sang it. Our Lord is a consuming fire. You're, you're either going to be purified by the refining fire of God or you will be consumed by the fires of his judgment. That's what he's referring to here. And so, verse 22, the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. Right now, mark in time. What's that going to begin? Romans eleven twenty-five. 25. Turn there for a second. Romans chapter 11. Chapter 9, 10, 11. What is it talking about? That God has not rejected Israel. That God has not forsaken Israel. That Israel is God's promise. His chosen people. And he will restore them. And God has promised Israel to be a nation and a kingdom here on this earth. Right? God has promised the church a kingdom in heaven. Mutually exclusive. The promises to Israel and the promises to uh, the church are not one and the same. Here he's promising the restoration of the nation. In verse 25, what does he say here? Now in the Greek text, it says, I do not desire you, ignorant brethren. No, is that what it says? No, no, no. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. I, unfortunately, I say that a lot, you know. <laughs> I mean, these people are so ignorant. Lest you be wise in your own opinion that hardening in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away the ungodliness of Jacob. And for this, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is when God pours out a spirit upon Israel because the church age is complete. The fullness of the Gentiles has taken place. The church has been raptured. This begins the 70th seven of Daniel. This begins the end of the world, the last seven years of, the, of world history as we know it right now. It's fascinating, isn't it? Verse 26. Chapter 39 of Ezekiel. We'll wrap this up pretty quickly. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies that all fell, that they all fell by the sword. And that's what took place, didn't it? The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Germans, the Muslims. I mean, just... But the slaughter of his people will end and he will preserve them. Verse 4, 24, according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob. I will have mercy on the whole house of Israel. I will be jealous for my holy name. After they have borne their shame and their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of the enemy's lands and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations. 
nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back into their own land and left none of them captive any longer. I will not hide my face from them anymore, nor shall I pour out my spirit. Excuse me. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord. There'll be a time. Listen, when God begins to work in the heart of a man or a woman or a nation, the first thing that happens is a, is a period of repentance. And this will be a period of national repentance for Israel. And then it'll bring about their spiritual restoration. Look at Joel chapter 2 for a minute. Joel 2. Joel 2, 28, do you have a heading over verse 28 in Joel chapter 2? The Lord will pour out His Spirit. What do you have, dear? The day of the Lord. My Bible says the last events before the terrible day of the Lord. This, this, God is prophesying what is going to take place before the tribulation period. He's going to be preserving His people Israel. And it shall come to pass, verse 28, chapter 2 of Joel, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Who's he talking to? Israel. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Have any visions, David? I'm I'm praying for dreams, you know. Also, on your maid, maid, manservants and maidservants, I will pour my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Turn to me to Zechariah. Zechariah. God is prophesying the restoration of his people Israel. All of human history, all of world history is judged and is determined, is measured by the way in which God is dealing with his people Israel. Go to Zechariah chapter 12. Do you have a heading over verse 10? Now remember that the chapter verse, chapter distinctions and verse distinctions are not in the original scroll, but we're very thankful for those men uh, who have given us a deeper understanding and an easier way to study the scriptures. So they have these headings over certain periods of the scripture that give us an indication of what's taking place. So do you have a heading over verse 10 in chapter 12? What? Him whom they have pierced. What, what else? Mourning for the pierced one. Spiritual salvation of Judah. Salvation of the restoration of Israel. The spiritual salvation. Look at verse 10. God is speaking. He's talking about what he's going to be doing to the Jewish people. This is right. Listen, what, what the Gog Magog invasion <coughs> initiates or sets off is going to be the revival of the nation of Israel spiritually. And the end of the age, the the last seven-year period of human history. Verse 10, I will pour out upon the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for the firstborn, a national repentance of the nation. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimen in the plain of Megiddo. In the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, the wives by themselves, the families of the house of Nathan by itself, the wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and the wives by themselves, the kings, the priests, everyone, all of the families of Israel, the the rich and the poor, the mighty and the weak, all will recognize how they've rejected their Messiah, their God, and they will mourn. There's going to be a national repentance of Israel as God brings about such a powerful spiritual revival. And remember, in those last days, there'll be 144,000 Apostle Pauls running around Jerusalem. The the 144,000 that are sealed, 12,000 from each tribe, they're Jews. They're Jews who have been given the gift of evangelism. They're evangelists, and they're going to go out evangelizing Israel. 144,000 Apostle Pauls. Wow, can you imagine? And then there'll be the two last days witnesses. Who are they? 
Moses and Elijah. And so all of Israel is going to recognize how they rejected their God, how they turned them. They will make their way back to God. And who's doing all of this? Who initiates all of this? God did that. God brought them. Just that we have to be so thankful that God has turned our hearts and our minds to him, our lives to him. We would have never come to him. The beginning of verse 12, I mean, excuse me, the beginning of chapter 12 in Zechariah, what does it say? The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. The creator God, Elohim, right? Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness for all surrounding peoples. They will lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. What's the problem? Anti-Semitism is global. Chapter 14 of Zechariah, go there. This is the last place we'll look, okay? Chapter 14, behold, verse 1, the day of the Lord is coming. Listen to me, you should be excited. The day of the Lord is coming. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. You believe that, don't you? Yes. Yeah. There's a war coming. That's what all the world is looking for. But we're looking for the warrior. We're looking for El Gabor, the mighty warrior, right? And another name for God. We didn't talk, talk about that one, Sonny, did we? No. El Gabor, the mighty warrior. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. How many nations? Oh. Will that include the United States? Yes, yes we're going to turn on them. Do listen to me. Who's the number one enemy in the government today? The government of the United States, who's their number one enemy? The church. That's exactly right. Listen to me now. Listen closely. The government understands and knows their number one enemy. For them to achieve all that they want to do, the only one standing in their way is the evangelical church. You Zionist Christians. You understand that? And just, just, just as we are number one, enemy number one right now, after the church is raptured, Israel becomes enemy number one. It's, it's growing there quickly now, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. There's no regard for the Jews, no regard for Israel. How in the world is it that the nations of the world are going to allow Iran to, to formulate a nuclear weapon? Listen to me, they're just days away. And nothing is going to stop them from doing it, except a preemptive strike by Israel. And that may be the very thing that sets it all off, that fires off this power kick, powder kick. Yes, I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. But look what it says here. It says, verse 3, For the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle, as he fights against Gog and Magog. He's going to fight during the day of Armageddon as well. And in that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will split in two, east and west. But for our conversation tonight, look what God does to these people. Look what God does when he rains down fire and brimstone upon Gog and Magog and upon some group of people who are in the farthest regions of the world. Verse 12. This shall be the plague with which the Lord, not Israel, the Lord will strike all the peoples who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will dissolve in their sockets. Their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Oh, boy. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem. And all the wealth of the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold, silver, apparel, and great abundance. Such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule, the camel and the donkey, and upon all the cattle that will be in those camps. So shall the plague be. What is this plague? It's thermal nuclear heat. You know, I, you know, when we went to that mindless movie the other night, I said, just enjoy the special effects. There's no meaning to any of this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's no story. It's just, you know, ah! You know. <laughs> so I said, just enjoy the special effects. That's why we came. It's mindless, you know. <clears throat> and, 
and, and you know, I used to like those Indiana Jones movies too because of the special effects. Did you like that? And you like the Indiana Jones when he's in search of the Ark of the Covenant? And you remember the Nazis, they got the Ark, and, and the Nazi dressed himself up like the high priest, and he's going to open the Ark of the Covenant. You remember what happened? Oh, boy. Now, the, the, whoever produced that movie, was it Spielberg? Whoever produced that movie did exactly what God is describing here in Zechariah chapter 14. What happened to those Nazis? Ah, they started screaming, and their flesh melted off their body, and you saw their bones, their, eye socket, their eyes melted in their eye sockets, their tongues melted in their mouth, and then the bones hit the ground. That, that's what would happen in thermal nuclear war. The heat is so intensive. You, you, your, your flesh, your blood, your, everything evaporates, is destroyed immediately, and just your bones fall to the ground. That aftermath of the Gog Magog, that's what they're marking. They're just marking bones that are in the desert. But it's radioactive. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. Doesn't he? The power and might. Our God is an awesome God. Shall we stand? <laughs>